1892, sticking with this year, um, the Cliftons are really responsible for why uh, popularity skyrockets. I threw in the box score, even though I know you can't read it, but the box score on the right is really the reason why. So they get this invitation, um, or in, probably in late June, to come and play a game at the Independence Day Fair in Ronsford, right? To get on the train and go over to Ronsford and play a game against Ronsford. So according to the newspaper, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 people show up to watch that game, which is a crazy attendance amount, if you really think about it. Um, a good number come from Clifton Forge. They fill up at least one passenger car on the way over to Ronsford, and they get destroyed. They lose 16 to 3. <laughs> they get absolutely annihilated uh, by Ronsford. But despite that, Despite that, the, um, both the Clifton Forge newspapers at the time um, really praised them. They praised them for showing this like great effort for representing the, te the, the city really well as a team. And they really encourage fans to turn out, say, this is a good thing that's happening here, and these are some really good guys. So go help them organize pickup games. Um, keep this sport going. Uh, they wind up... Um, organizing other games as well around town. So the sport is so popular that somewhere around 100 to 125 people show up to watch a game between local doctors and lawyers who have never actually played baseball before. They just kind of throw them out there in this pickup game. And people absolutely love it. They, they completely eat it up despite the fact that these people really suck at baseball. It's still entertaining to watch. So that's the first event that happens. They get 1,500 people to come to a game in Ronsford, of all places. The second thing that happens is another game that they play in West Virginia. They get invited to come out and play at the Lewisburg Fair. Okay? And so Lewisburg is staging this big tournament between Clifton Forge, or sorry, the Cliftons, to be very specific, the Cliftons, um, Hinton, Lewisburg, and Ronsford. So they structure this tournament since the Cliftons have to travel the furthest, the Cliftons automatically play in the finals. Okay? So the newspapers organize, again, they organize this gigantic group of people to go over to Lewisburg. Um, to cheer on the Cliftons so they can be named, quote, fair champion. And they have these banners in the newspaper that say, Cliftons protect the good name of Clifton Forge. So they're very much so tying together, right, this club to the city name. So for um, this game, somewhere between three and 4,000 people attend this random game between, you know, two amateur clubs, one from uh, West Virginia and one from Clifton Forge. The Cliftons explicitly bring 66 people with them. 66 people travel with the team. So like I said, it was this weird tournament. So the Lewisburg beats Ronsford, um, they beat Hinton, and then it becomes this match between Lewisburg and the Cliftons in the finals, in which the Cliftons win. They win 10 to five in the finals, and they're declared this Lewisburg fair champion, right? They're really, really excited about this. Um, so the newspapers go nuts. They absolutely run with this, and they treat it like they won the freaking World Series. Um, they call it this like dominating victory. They say, oh, the Cliftons are so good, they'll quote, they're going to have to play, they will have to play Lynchburg, Richmond, maybe even the University of Virginia to make games more competitive and interesting to the spectators. Yeah. <laughs> they only won 10 to 5. It wasn't that, that big of a win, right? So they wound up playing a few more games against some local clubs, and the season ends. They're officially 8 and 2 is their official um, uh, final record. Kind of as a sign of how popular they've become, the newspaper says um, that throughout the year, home games averaged between 250 and 300 spectators, despite the fact they didn't have a stadium or a common field that they played on. They played in different locations each time. So that's pretty wild. I think the most people I ever saw at a game I played at in Clifton Forge was about 40, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> if we're lucky, and those were mostly parents. Um, so the newspaper continues to, to heap praise upon them, right? They say, um, uh, all of these boys are, quote, popular with our best people. Quote, this town now has a cause that it can feel proud in. A town this size can draw such audiences. And, quote, this is like the, the big line that I, that's important for later, is, quote, the Cliftons were gentlemanly fellows, all of them. They really had, like, latch on to this term, gentlemanly. And I'll go way more into that in a little bit. A couple more details about um, this club. Um, I mentioned the Chesapeake Ball Club, that manager, Collins, right? Collins gets so into baseball, he purchases a newspaper 
like in part to report on uh, baseball. He buys the Valley Virginian, which is a paper that kind of bounces back and forth between Clifton Forge and Stanton. And he reports like crazy on baseball. He just loves it. Um, 1892, that's also the year that the Cliftons um, recruit a player. His name's William Donovan. I'll just tell you about Donovan because I think he's an interesting dude. Um, Donovan was the best Clifton Forge player by far for the next three years. So 1892, 93, 94. He's the number three hitter. He's the pitcher. He is. He absolutely kills it. Um, he was actually a professional. Um, he played for a team called, uh, a team didn't have a mascot named Lewiston in the New England League. It's the equivalent of double A baseball, right? So he was playing for Lewiston in 1891. And I think he wasn't getting enough playing time. His dad was a local businessman here in Clifton Forge. So he winds up quitting Lewiston to come down and just play amateur ball for a few years. And he's so good, he, he gets recruited by a pro team in Stanton at the end of 1894. He winds up playing for the Stanton Hayseeds. It's a great name for a team, the Hayseeds. Um, by the end of that season, he uh, winds up taking a managerial job at for the Newport News uh, Club, the Newport News Deckhands, which is also another great team name. Um, after that, he kind of disappears for a while. He doesn't seem to play baseball much unless the records have been lost. He does come back to Gluten Forge in 1900 to play a couple of games. He, again, bats third, despite the fact that he's been away for, three, for five years by that point. And then by about 1905, he seems to be done with baseball. And what Donovan actually does is he moves to Alabama and he forms a grocery company that grows into being the brand Red Diamond, which is now like the third biggest tea manufacturer in, in the America, in the country. So Donovan goes on to do some pretty excellent stuff. Um, let's go back to the club. So 1894. Um, that's the biggest year. I've mentioned 1892 with these fairs and like this big spectacle that's going on. 1894 is when they start to really um, take themselves seriously. They finally buy real jerseys for the first time. They reach out to the Spalding Company and they buy um, these jerseys that are gray with black socks. Sometimes they call themselves the Clifton Grays. Sometimes the Grays and the Cliftons are separate. But you have like this more professional looking team. They're still amateur, but you have this really um, professional looking club. You also see um, the emergence of youth baseball, as far as I can tell, for the first time. I mentioned a few minutes ago the Clifton Blues, right? That team that played in blue. The Blues reformed this year, but this time they're explicitly a team for kids, right? As far as I can guess, probably between 10 and 13 years old, right? But this is the first time you're really seeing young kids play. Um, combined that year, the Cliftons and the Grays play 18 games, right, that are at least documented in newspapers. Um, they play against teams from Iron Gate, Covington. They play a team called the Covington Stars, Craigsville, Hinton, um, a team from Stanton, a team called the Stanton Columbians, and Lewisburg. Um, they wind up over the next few years of, between uh, 95 and 97, they start broadening their spectrum a little bit. They start playing clubs from Charlottesville, from Falling Spring has a club, Lomore has a club, um, and teams from Roanoke uh, come over the mountain to play. And throughout, the leadership of the club was generally the three Mahaney brothers, John, James, and George, and the, one of the Clifton originals named Cliff Ham. So, the rest of the time, so I've made it through that in about 30 minutes. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I kind of want to illustrate how this club is really different than all the other clubs that are playing at the time. This is why the story, I mean, the story hooks me because I'm from Clifton Forge and I'm literally wearing a baseball shirt that says Clifton Forge on it. But <laughs> they're very different in the way that they play the game. I mentioned that word gentlemanly earlier, right? And so they really approach the sport with this kind of, it's a little bit foreign to us, but they approach it with this like gentlemanly, like mindset. They really emphasize um, like public refinement, dignity, order, fairness, courage, respectability, all these values um, kind of above actually playing the game, right? So if you ask the Cliftons, would you rather win or would you rather look good doing it and be respectable doing it? They'd probably say look good doing it. That was much more important to them in many, many ways. So when I kind of distill it down, these are the four values that they express, okay? The first one is that gentlemanly behavior, that respectable behavior on the field. Um, that can manifest in a lot of different ways, and I'll give a couple of examples of all of these. The second one is a very strong insistence upon honest umpiring and really this campaign 
against um, corruption, right? Corruption from the umpires specifically. Um, the third one is getting rid of rowdiness, getting rid of drunkenness at their games. And the last one is what I'm calling, they used this word, I love this word because it's a weird word. Um, they didn't want any of their opponents to be amalgamation clubs. What that means is they wanted any ball club to represent the city they actually came from. So Clifton Forge's team better be consistent with Clifton Forge ball players, right? Covington's team better have Covington's playing on the team, right? You didn't want any outside recruitment. There's a few other little things that they emphasize that I might touch on if I have time. Um, they did emphasize like skillful, graceful play, right? They really valued like smoothly gathering a ball and smoothly throwing it as opposed to diving for it and getting dirty. Um, they really loved large crowds. They basically hated playing in front of about 15 people. Um, they valued tidy uniforms. Even if they didn't match, they still had to be like clean and pressed. Um, they really valued having women at their games, female fans, and they really valued um, this dedication that once you signed up for the club, you had to play for the club as many games as you could the rest of the year. Um, I'll say too, to kind of emphasize how different they are, you know, historians have written a lot about baseball in the South and baseball in Appalachia, and I don't think any of them have really touched on, on this type of behavior. Um, I think there's a lot more to be said about it, especially in this region. Um, I will note that you know I leaned a little bit on Elizabeth Hicks Corrin's like local history book, right? She wrote that book called um, Clifton Forge Scenic Busy Friendly. Is that the the subtitle? Yeah. Subtitle. And it's a great book, but she does she actually has a line in there where she says that um, the young men were too busy working to spare time for recreation, so there was no baseball before 1914, which I think is a kind of a funny line. The book is fantastic, but that's a funny line that we need to dig into. Um, so let's go and look at behavior. So to give you an idea of what these games that I've been referencing look like, right? So whenever a visiting club came to Clifton Forge in 1890, that very first year, 1890, it was really simple. They probably, well, not probably, I know what they did a couple of times. They would come down to the train station right down here. They would get off the train. They would walk to wherever the field was. They play the game and they go home. Nice and simple, okay? Contrast that, four years later, you would have like freaking parades. It was absolutely nuts. You would have groups, like mobs of like a, at least 100 people would go down to the train station, greet the opposing team off of the train. Um, quite often there'd be women that would like give them flowers and stuff like that as they came off the train. They would escort them to the field, sometimes with a band, um, and then they would offer them free lodging to stay overnight if they wanted to, with free food as well. So it was this like big opulent thing, almost like a ceremony, right? It was this big to do. Um, they really, really, really wanted other teams to do that for them as well. <laughs> they really hoped that other teams would reciprocate. So, for example, um, one of those games in 1892 when they played Ronsfort, um, they came home after that defeat, and in the newspaper, they basically said that um, we are very sad that we lost, but man, those Ronsford people know how to throw a good party. They know how to host us. We really, really enjoyed our time. Um, the quote was, is, um, the Cliftons have nothing but good words to say for Ronsford and her people. Let everybody turn out. If they do beat us at playing ball next time, see to it that they don't beat us in hospitality. Right? Um, yeah, this is like one of the newspapers where the quotes are. I know you probably can't read that. Um, Another similar message, the visit to Ronsford will be remembered with pleasure, and the Clifton's only wish is that they may soon have the opportunity of showing the gentlemanly Ronsford club that if we do not beat them at baseball, we do at least beat them in hospitality and good feeling, right? Um, so this was, again, like pretty uncommon. This is, you know, this is happening around the country, but it's starting to really die out. So the Clifton's are very different in that way. So what about on-field um, activity? So on the field, um, again, looking good while doing it and showing that effort is what really mattered. So they played a game in 1897. And I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but they made somewhere around 15 errors in that game, which is a disaster, right? an absolute abject disaster. Um, so when they make these errors, the newspaper publishes an article, and one of the very first lines in that article says, if you want to play ball, you must go into it heart and soul, get in the game with both your feet and your hands on occasion. So they played like crap. The newspaper kept just 
ripping them week after week after week. They said they were embarrassing them. They said that fans should go to the game and, quote, razz the players whenever they committed an error to try to keep them from making errors. So what they wound up doing, the newspaper wound up doing, is they went out and found that original captain, James Mahaney. Right? They went out and they got James Mahaney, and they said, for God's sake, please come back and make this team respectable again. Like, make them actually play ball. So Mahaney agrees. He brings back some of those original 1890s players, and they perform really well. They play very, very well the rest of the season. Um, kind of as a mark of how much the town cared about that, they actually had a fund drive where women, uh, female fans of the team, gathered up money so they could buy this like gigantic basket of flowers and like bring it to the game and give it to the players like after the game was over. Kind of as this like, thank you for um, being good at baseball, I guess you know. So you get the idea. So. That's part one, right? That um, respectable behavior. Part two is umpires, okay? And this is like kind of um, splitting hairs between the way we think about umpiring today and the way that they thought about umpiring then. But it's really important in context, right? So the context is, is that in the 1890s, there was no such thing as a professional umpire in a place like this. Each team was supposed to bring somebody with them to serve as umpire. You had two volunteer umpires, and as you can imagine, these guys were probably very, very corrupt the first chance they got. They were going to cheat for their team whenever they could. Um, this is like rampant everywhere in the 1890s. And so the Cliftons decide to buck the trend. They decide, you know what? What if we actually had fair umpires? Wouldn't that be crazy? So they go out and they start recruiting uh, some of the most respectable men around town. The three names I'll throw at you, they, res they recruit Russ Ham, who owns a grocery store. They recruit J.W., I hope I pronounce it right, Lipop, L-I-P-O-P, Lipop, um, who owns a jewelry store downtown. And they recruit Judge C.F. Moore. Judge Moore is the judge for Clifton Forge, Covington, and Allegheny. So that's a pretty big statement when you're rolling out the judge as your umpire, right? You can tell you're trying to be very serious. Um, Questioning umpires, though, was a bit of um, a problem in a lot of ways in a lot of towns. It could get very violent uh, with the questioning of umpires. So it, one example I'll give is in Covington. Covington questions an umpire at one game, and they write a letter to the editor that straight up says, quote, if ever another game is played, that fella had better not attempt to umpire if he wants to be alive when the game is over. So that's in the newspaper. <laughs> um, it's not good. So the Clifton's recognizing, we don't want violence. We want some good men to be umpires. How do we make this happen? So they try to do this in a very respectable, gentlemanly way. They don't ever threaten violence, but they will kind of stage these like protests, right? So this um, headline over there on the other side where it says, the Clifton's win in spite of a strong opposing team and an unscrupulous umpire. Um, they try to draw that line between like the umpire and the club, they will always say, well, the players were really great. They were really nice guys. The manager, he was a really good guy. But that umpire, man, he was awful. <laughs> they will just like be kind of say, this guy was just not gentlemanly. He was not respectable. He didn't treat the game with, um, with honor. So they, in the newspaper, it wrote about the Hinton, this game against Hinton. Quote, Hinton had come ready to make up an umpiring what they lacked in ball playing. With the boldness of a highwayman, he called the Cliftons out when there was no ground for it. He had a miserable attempt to steal the game. Most of the Hinton players, uh, da, da, da. when we tried to remove him from the game, most of the Hinton players did ultimately agree. He was not a gentlemanly man in the least. So you get the idea that they really don't want to incite violence, but they want to try to figure out a way. How do we get rid of these corrupt guys without spreading violence? Um, and this reputation of Clifton Ford's wanting to get rid of umpires is evident in newspapers. There's like so many letters to the editor of other team's baseball fans writing letters to Clifton Forge to tell them which umpires are corrupt. Right? This doesn't really show up in other newspapers. So like one letter from a, a fan from Roanoke who played a game in Covington, writing of the Covington umpire, said, that umpire did them like dirt. The umpire was rotten. The hotel was not so good. Let a good crowd go from Clifton Forge and win. So you can get the idea. They didn't really like Covington either at that point.